All right. Uh, so we're here today. Uh, going to talk to you about a very exciting uh, topic in one way with stories and insights <laughs> and whatever. But Ken here thinks that it's not necessarily a sexy topic, but it's a critical one. Uh, so we're going to talk about the go, no go decision. Uh, but before we get into that, a little bit about Parix. Uh, so we are a digital product company. And essentially, when custom uh, software is needed, meaning off the shelf solutions do not work, uh, our clients ask us to build cool things. And our mantra is pretty simple, right? Uh, cool people with cool projects. And whether it's a web application, two-sided marketplace, a mobile app, ultimately, we're just not building software, right? There's so much more to digital products and product management uh, than taking orders or specs for software. Sometimes we get involved in customer support and, uh, you know, scaling operations, picking the right technology, UX, UI, branding. There's just so many different elements. And ultimately, we think it takes a village. And we're proud that we have a really great product team that can help support all of those basic needs. So why are we here today? Uh, Ken, uh, you know, you and I had a great conversation uh, a couple of weeks back, and we were talking about the statistics and the data of, you know, 95% of digital products that are released in the markets fail. Uh, but we didn't want to put emphasis on the failure rate. We wanted to put emphasis on, well, time out. What, what are the teams that represent the 5% doing? Let's learn from that. Let's really lean into that. And that's kind of what the culture of Parix is all about. It's doing things that other teams are not doing. So it doesn't matter how much finance you have, doesn't matter how big you are. It's just about working smarter and applying those principles to get better results. Uh, so excited uh, you know, to follow with the, the five club. And today's topic again is the no no-go decision or the go decision. Uh, so I just wanted to throw it over to you. Uh, what are you thinking? Yeah, thanks, Cesar. Um, and this is uh, this really is what our entire series is all about. It's it's this idea of how do we help people make better decisions, how to build better products, get into the market better. Uh, and it's really a whole spectrum of things from the very first, you know, ideation and and you know where the uh, where innovation comes from and how you execute that properly. So, as Cesar said, uh, you know, I was a little bit, uh, I had a little trepidation about this topic because uh, it's not particularly sexy. You know, the go no go decision uh, isn't exactly, uh, you know, it's not the same thing as you know pitch decks and scaling and you know go to market strategies and all that kind of stuff. But this is something that you and I have talked about so many times over the years. Is how do entrepreneurs and product teams, it's not just for small companies, by the way, this is really across the entire spectrum of companies from absolute first-time entrepreneurs all the way up to Fortune 500 companies. They are forced to uh, to make these decisions when they have ideas and, and they have an innovation uh, process and um, how they make them and and why they make the decisions they, they do is sometimes a little bit baffling and a little bit uh, concerning and alarming. And when we talk to entrepreneurs, uh, very often, you know, we say, okay, what, what made you go down this path? Where did, how did you make the decision to invest your life savings and, and build this thing or, or whatever it was? And um, very often it's based on intuition. It's based on their idea that uh, they've had. Maybe it's been gnawing them for years. I've had this idea since, you know, 1992. You know, it's, it's, it's funny how often uh, we hear things like that, that this is something that uh, entrepreneurs uh, want to want to build for a long, long time, and uh, the decision to go forward is uh, is a huge one. It's a giant one. The pain points uh, around making a bad decision about building a product is, you know, you maybe uh, everything from slow to slow market penetration and 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 you know sluggish traction, uh, those kinds of things, to absolute product failure and no adoption whatsoever. And you're and and you know if you're a startup. If your product fails, your company fails and everyone loses. All of your stakeholders, you know, all of your investors, your time and money, the effort that you put into it can just go away in a heartbeat. And we just see it way, way too often. So when you and I were talking about this, uh, yeah, it didn't, didn't sound all that sexy at first. Uh, but then after the more we talked about it, I said, this is so fundamental and it's such a big topic that let's, let's tackle it. And it's funny, well, I was talking... Go ahead. I was just going to key in, you know, I always like to talk about the pain points, right? Because when people are listening, like, what's the pain that we know is felt when this particular topic is not taken seriously, right? And you kind of hit the, the nail on the head from a high level perspective, which is 
deciding to, I am going to actually design and build this thing. There's so many ripple effects that go beyond uh, when you make that decision. And you mentioned it, right? If you are a small startup or, you know, it doesn't matter. What if you're a bigger corporation, but there's a product line riding on this, right? The second that you've invested time, money, energy, and whatever, it's not just you as the stakeholder that wants to move this. It's everyone around you that you've influenced to follow your vision and to execute this. And that can add up to a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of hours, and a lot of cost. Mm -hmm. uh, so not really truly setting the foundation of your research and validating certain things and kind of going through that really tough decision, should I do this? Again, it's not just you. It's all your team and all the people around you. And uh, we talked about the, the pain point of so many times people come to us with that vision. They're so excited. They're so enthusiastic. They're almost like jumping and ready to go. And we're like, time out, time out, time out. Let's fall in love with that problem to make sure we answer some critical questions. And that's kind of really the pain point there, right? And I, I know you got some insights and a story. I got a story to tell to maybe to kick it off and then we'll get into like uh, the, the the meat and the, uh, the potatoes of this whole conversation. Uh, do you want to start with your story? You want me to kind of throw no, one of my insights out? Uh, no, I think you're, I think, uh, go ahead and tell your story, Cesar, because I think it's really illustrative of how well-funded, well, you know, uh, well-staffed, great team, and uh, you know, and a and a solid idea apparently um, it can wind up with a with a, a real uh, issue and problem and in, in getting traction in the marketplace. So I think that's a really great story to kick this off. Sure. So uh, at a super high level, the the product was building a learning management system. It would have a, a components of a continuing education credits. Uh, it was based around healthcare and ethics. Uh, and you, we wanted to prove that people were actually learning instead of, you know, how you can just go to a workshop, you get the continuing education, but can you really prove if someone learned something type of a thing? Uh, so the testing mechanisms, we had a pre-test and a post-test so we can actually show the scores of learning. We had, if you failed the test, it could quickly go back and help you with this is where the answers are. This is why you missed this question. So the proving of learning and the continuing education was way more valid than other systems. Uh, we had top-notch content. Uh, we had people at St. Louis University, they were head of the healthcare ethics, writing curriculum and dealing with uh, the university. So we had experts and authority uh, in place. Uh, the production of the videos and sample cases. One of the example uh, cases was the Terry Schiavo case. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a very restricted case based on a lot of things that were going on, a lot of tough decisions in the medical community. So even though we had the production quality was high, this was a custom application that we were writing, you know, a lot of investment went into this, right? The hospital systems were telling us, this is amazing. We would love to have this. But at the end of the day, when the system was built, who was going to pay for it, right? And whether there wasn't enough value, uh, ultimately, the, the health, uh, health hospital systems were kind of balking at, yeah, hey, we told you this, but uh, we're really not the division that pays for that. Or the funds that are in place are just not good. So getting that whole thing off the ground was extremely challenging. And I always remember the feeling of, man, so much effort got put into this. So much user-centric design went into this. So many interviews with people and making sure that everything from start to finish was at top quality, but it didn't pan out the way we wanted. Yeah. Uh, could we have asked better questions in the beginning? Could we have done more research before spending all that time and energy? And again, it had nothing to do with the quality and the teams and what we were doing. It had to do with market circumstances and, and who's willing to pay and how much value that adds to the system at, at large. So I just thought that was a great story to kind of tell that it's not like we put together a crap product and obviously that's why it failed or that we didn't have the right team and so many other factors, uh, but it, it's just killer, right? Uh, so anyway, sharing yeah. so uh, it, it, everyone can learn from that experience. It, it's a great story. And um, and I think that really the, the takeaway from that story is that just being better and having a, you know, having a better solution and even solving problems is not enough. Uh, you know, we we say it ourselves, you know, fall in love with the problem, not the solution. And we live by that. And it's important because it's, you're starting with what problems are you are you solving? 
there's another step. There's another me you know, measure is are the switching costs, you know, the, the cost of switching to your solution, are they so high that it's a barrier to someone adopting your product? And that's a harder, that's a harder measure to, 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 you know, to uncover. Um, and, uh, but it's an important one. And I think that this is one of the things that product teams and founders need to really do is spend a lot of time thinking about not just what's, what problem we're solving and whether our product is better and all of that. It's, uh, it's that you have to be able to, uh, you know, th that your product has to have enough compelling value that it's worthwhile for someone to adopt what you're doing, where you know, adopt your product and to move away from their current situation. And people will sometimes say, uh, you know, when I challenge them on that, they might say, well, there's no competition. There's no, there's no competition for this, for this product. No one's doing this. I said, well, yeah, there is. It's the current situation. It's there. They might use three different platforms or they may even do it manually, but they are getting their work done or they are doing there. They have a solution that they've adopted. Um, and you're having to fight that every single time. And that is a much more difficult thing to uncover. Um, so uh, yeah, let's, let's dive into some of the some of the things that we think are important uh, concerning innovation and, and how you make that decision to move forward. And I think one of the first things I wanted to talk about a little bit is that this is not a singular decision. I think, you know, there's very often this idea that you're, you do a little bit of analysis, do a little discovery, and let's go forward. Let's do it. And I think uh, that is the wrong way to look at it. Um, it's almost like climbing a hill. You know, you're going to take steps. Uh, at the beginning, you may uncover a little, uh, little, little bit of information. Maybe you have a, an idea. Maybe you've uncovered a problem in your industry or in your, in your life that you think is worthy of, of tackling. And so you do a little bit of discovery and you go to the next step. Uh, yes, that looks like it's valuable. There's no competition that we can see that is really addressing this pain point that we, that we have identified. So you go to the next step and you maybe do some analysis and you do some, talk to some people and you may say, okay, this is, maybe this has got legs. And then you embark on a, on a more rigorous journey of discovery, collecting data and really going through the, the process. But it's not just idea, build a little MVP and then launch a product. That's not the way it should be done. It is, it is a step-by-step -step process. So it's, it's very iterative, it's very analytical and you have to be able to let go of an idea if it's not panning out. I think the key thing here is like data supporting what you're trying to accomplish, right? And uh, one of the things uh, they teach at MIT Design X that's critical, right? Is there's a, the idea of you know intuition based, uh, you know uh, thinking, and then there's the needs based thinking. And too many times, the 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 excited founder or whoever's leading the charge. They think they know, they're like, I am the avatar. I am the user. So I am the expert, whatever I think goes, and that's just enough value. And we know that even though that's a great start to have a subject matter expert or an authority or whatnot, it's not enough data. It's not enough of a data sample. And there's so many more factors that need to be put into that needs-based design that uncover the data supporting whether your intuition is right. So there's nothing wrong with having great intuition, right? Uh, but wrong. let's validate that. And that right there is the key thing that is missing, right? So we talk about that as a pain point. And sure enough, we talked to several. You've talked to some prospects. I've talked to some prospects that want to come work with us and hire Parix to do certain things. And the first thing we ask is, hey, can we talk to customers? Can we get user centric? Can we do this discovery? Are you formally willing to do this R and D? Because if you're not, you're cutting a very important uh, corner here, right? And they're like, "What are you talking about? Like, I know this stuff better than anything else." And there's nothing wrong with that, but that's a stereotype that we have to debunk if you're serious about building product and wanting to be successful, right? Again, the top five percent of product teams they do this. Every single time, and every time. never cut this quarter, right? It never. Uh, so I don't know. It's just it's just a funny discussion that we have with a lot of people uh, when we're talking about potentially, you know, partnering and starting a project. Uh, yeah, and that's a that's a great point. And I think um, one of the things that you have to get past are your um, your early adopters, your close affiliated affiliated people in your network, your customers, current customers. Um, and very often we see ide ideas come out of uh, someone's uh, need that they've identified in their industry. They're the user. 
they've they've got the problem. And like you said, uh, that's not enough because you you have to go past that. And if you're if you've got some early adopters who are very passionate about what you're doing, they're kind of blowing smoke a little bit sometimes. They're not mm-hmm. int- intentionally doing that. The they are passionate about your about your project and your product. Uh, and those people are like gold. They are they're phenomenal people to have on your team. Uh, they're they're going to be your evangelists. They're going to be the people out there telling their network about your product. The problem is, is that if you don't survive contact with the mainstream users in your market, if then you have no, you know, you have no chance for success or you're going to be, uh, you know, struggling to get the traction that you anticipated. So you have to get past those, those uh, early, early adopter users that are going to make you think that you're on the right track when you may not be. And that's a little bit, uh, that's a little bit tricky uh, thing to do. And I know there was uh, there's a lot of studies and and uh, you know a lot of uh, a discussion with uh, founders who have failed and why they failed and why they they didn't get traction. And um, we also often talk about the CB Insights um, study that that interviewed hundreds of founders that failed, and they said 35% found that there was no market need for the product. 35%. Now I think it's actually higher than that because another 37% said that they didn't get you know, they ran out of money and and all of that. And I think that if you're scaling and if you found that product market fit so elusive, sometimes you're going to be able to find money. You're gonna yeah, you're gonna have uh, runway and that sort of thing. So I think it's really really high the number of of uh, you know ventures and and product teams that launch something that just doesn't get uh, enough traction. And that's that's really stunning. Uh, and there's got to be a better way to do it. I think a valuable insight here is uh, you made a point of uh, there's this product that we're putting out and it's going to be better than the competition or better than that exists. And here's the factors of why it's better, right? I think it's good to tell everybody that, yes, that's one scenario, but a lot of this applies to there's no product in the market that does what we're going to do. We're solving something and there's no competition. And that might be almost like a, something you hide behind going, oh, just because nothing exists out there for this thing that we're trying to do, it's an easy shoe. It's This is a, hey, we're going to immediately get a product market fit and we're golden. And sometimes that's not, that's not true, right? There are reasons why that particular product or service might not exist. There might have been a whole bunch of other teams that tried it and failed and you just can't find that data. You can't find that example. So I think this is something that stretches on both sides of that equation. It's just not one or the other uh, based on some of the criteria you were sharing. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, that's exactly it. Um, you know, I, I think I was telling you about this uh, company that I was interacting with online and they had built a product for their particular industry that they were active in, spent a lot of money on it. And one of their uh, chief selling points was is that, um, you know, they were significantly better, more modern interface, great user experience. But the big pain point that they envisioned um, was that the entire network of people that use this particular product, the main, their main competitor that they were trying to knock off, uh, all of their interactions and, and community was based on Facebook. So it was not built into the product. They were they had a, a closed Facebook group. So if you bought their product and were part of that, uh, you know, product, uh, you know, a customer of that of that product, uh, you got access to this Facebook group, and there were thousands of users there, and they all interacted there. And he thought that, that was a real miss. So he built a new product, and he built that interaction in, essentially built that Facebook, you know, kind of interaction into his product, and launched it, and he got no users like none. And it was pretty obvious why it didn't, you know, I was quizzing him online uh, just a little bit and asking him what, what he thought the reason was. And what he uncovered was, is that in order for someone to use his product, they would have to give up the community that they were uh, interacting with on Facebook. So he essentially had to get everyone to come over all at once, which was totally unrealistic and impossible. So if everyone can't come, then no one's going to come. And that would have been something that should have been discovered in, in that product and customer discovery and, and market discovery. And he just failed to do it. 
So now he spent hundreds of thousands of dollars building a product that has zero traction and has fallen completely flat. And the number of times that we see that is just stunning. You know, well, when we have these little stories and conversations with prospects and whatnot, uh, you know, when you're looking behind, it's like 2020. It's like, <laughs> this, this was so obvious. Like, why didn't we take a time out to think about this, right? But for some reason, it's not intuitive to challenge all this stuff when you have all this excitement and it's like about this product and you're trying to solve the, the, the problem and whatnot. Um, it's, it's just different, right? And sometimes it's as simple as, yeah, we could have found that with some simple R&D. And a lot of the times we, we, we hear these little crazy insights and we're like, oh my God, how much time and energy could you have saved had you put this a little bit more difficult early on in the process, but it could have saved you so much time and energy, or you could have pivoted, or you could have done something along with Facebook to go with that particular example. Uh, so yeah, uh, 2020 hindsight is huge, but it's too late. And I think that's kind of the point, right? It's a, mm -hmm. can you just slow down just a little bit? just to try to make sure you're hammering all these points and make sure you got your data and make sure you're talking to customers to really identify, are there any things that I can't see in front of me, even though I'm super excited and we're making progress on the solution? Exactly. And I think um, one of the things that you have to be able to do when you start this journey is you have to be prepared to give up your idea. And it's it's not easy to do when you've got a dream and you're so excited about it, uh, you think that it's going to be a winner. And I think entrepreneurs, by their nature, are very optimistic. We're I know I am. I always think that I can just figure it out and then and uh, I'll, I'll work through it. And, you know, we're also not risk averse. Uh, you know, we accept risk and we know that. We also understand the value of of risk. Uh, there's a, there actually is a value of having some risk. If you had no risk, there's no there's no opportunity. So we have to have some risk, uh, and you can never eliminate it completely. But I think you know the relationship that we have with risk is really an important one. Uh, it's more than just um, you know saying okay, I'm I'm fine with having some risk in my in my life and my venture and so forth, uh, and and it is. But I think at the same time, you have to do everything within, you know, within your power to eliminate that risk or minimize the impact of it and be aware of what the of what the risks are. And I just see so many entrepreneurs just plow head first and uh, and can't be dissuaded until until they crash and burn. And that's what we you know, we try really hard to to, uh, you know, dissuade people, um, you know, for making those bad decisions. Now, there's a, a, a couple of founders I was working with a few years ago. And they had a very adventurous uh, product that they were trying to develop and they were thinking about developing. And they'd gone through one of the programs that I mentioned for. And they spent a lot of time talking to industry people and customers and they did their homework. And I get a, you know, get a call from him say he wants to talk. And I said, great, let's talk. And he said, we decided we're not moving forward. The, the barriers are too high. Uh, there's too many obstacles. Uh, we have to we'd have to build hardware and get it installed in stores. And I mean, it's just, it was a lot of stuff. And he said, we just don't have the resources to do it. And he they just made a fantastic decision. And I told him, I said, you know, I think this is a real win for you guys. Um, they could have just beaten their head against the wall and really tried everything they could to move heaven and earth in order to, to make this happen. And they wouldn't have succeeded. They just didn't have the resources to do it. So I consider that a, actually a big win. You know, and sometimes no doesn't have to be a hard no forever. It could be a, it's a no for now until we figure out ABC. And then maybe we'll, we'll get it back on track, whether that be technology, whether that be funding, whether that be uh, legal governance. There's so many factors uh, that sometimes you can't control everything, right? Uh, so half the battle is timing, you know? Uh, so, so no, I think, I think that's an excellent call out. Think about the, even if the decision is a no go, well, if it's a no-go, think of all the time, energy, and whatever. Go chase another solution or pivot your idea or whatever that is. It's still a fundamental part of being successful, right? Um, so, no, I think that's a great call out. Well, you made you made a, a really good point there when you said pivot. Um, 
how much better would it be to pivot early on when you're talking to customers and you're trying to ideate and you're doing some prototyping, how much better is it to pivot there than pivoting when you've launched your product and you've done your big splash and you're trying to go to market and you're not getting traction uh, because you didn't uncover the barriers? I how much better right is it there. to do it then than, than, than at the end? Yeah, the experience and the insight to share with everyone is iteration, right? And we, I mean, in fact, we had a whole webinar on it, on prototyping. Uh, and prototyping is not, yes, it can help you with a go, no, go decision. But guess what? We talked about, it doesn't stop there. You have to continuously iterate. You got to continuously prove it and you got to continuously validate. That's what teams that are serious about launching successful products are all about. It's uh, what, what got us here today might be different based on yesterday based on new challenges and new barriers and new things going on. So you're always, always playing with that pressure. You're trying to poke holes in what you're doing. And through that iteration and through that being open, I think sometimes those companies are able to react, adapt quicker, pivot quicker. Oh, absolutely. And sometimes that is key to getting to market first. And sometimes like, you know, timing can be good on both sides, but launching months earlier and launching with the right you know, solution can get you those results where you would have failed. And sometimes the course correction can be slight. We're not talking about huge pivots sometimes, right? Sometimes it's the technology. Sometimes it's the user experience. Sometimes it's the, you know what? We, we selected the wrong sub-market. There's so many factors, right? But if you're always iterating and you're always paying attention to these little things, it can make the, a huge difference and save your business for sure. Yeah, I think you know we're iteration is one of those things that we we spend a ton of time thinking about, talking about, and bringing to the table. The product journey is not a linear journey. It is not from idea and I you know and and developing an MVP and then going to the next step. I mean, those are milestones. Uh, but the the truth is that iter iteration happens continuously, like you said. You're always continuing to have feedback loops, uh, even after you've gotten into the market. Let's say you're getting traction, you're doing really well if you've done your homework, right? And that's that's one of the uh, outcomes of that. Um, but as you're developing new new features and functions, you're always continuing to listen to your customers, find out what their needs are and the pain points and problems are, prototyping new ideas, uh, making sure that when you don't continue to add on to your product, that you don't break it. Uh, don't break the user experience or add products and features that don't make sense and get in the way or change a product uh, feature that is no longer usable. And we see this you know, all the time. I have a little insight to share, right? And this is, I think, something that we both laugh at. I saw it online. I'm like, that totally makes sense, right? Uh, there's a lot of people that when they're in their development cycle of MVP, they're like, well, we need this feature. We need this feature. We need this feature. We need that feature. And this is not going to succeed unless we have this feature and that feature. And it's almost like timeout. You don't even have customers yet. And last time I checked, for you to be successful, you need to have customers. And those customers that are paying for you are going to tell you, here's the features that we want. So yes, there's always a baseline that you start out with, but don't try to fill the gamut with all these features without even knowing you have validation. You're, all you're doing is like spending time and energy building all these things that might not even be necessary. Uh, so just, just throwing that little nugget out there, it's like, hey, if you really care about features, you got to have customers first. So well, yeah. yeah. And I think uh, when we see a lot of pitch decks, we, we see that. Um, you know, I saw a product uh, roadmap that had 25 branded features. I counted it. It was in an Excel document and they had every single one of them was outlined and they couldn't pull off one, much less 25. And, you know, look, as you, if you're talking to investors, they want realism. They want somebody who can execute. They don't want a uh, pie in the sky vision. They want somebody who has got a product roadmap that makes sense, that's thoughtful, that's strategic, that's, uh, you know, and there's nothing wrong with having features mapped out for, you know, Q3 of 2026 and those there's no nothing wrong with having a a feature roadmap but when you've got uh you know sometimes dozens of features that you've got planned that you want to execute all at once 
uh, you're not going to be taken seriously and you shouldn't be taken seriously. One of the things you mentioned uh, a couple of times here is um, switching barriers, right? And we talked about how that obviously can affect costs and whatnot. Uh, but one important aspect that we talk about is network effects. I was wondering if you could just highlight that for us and kind of talk about that, because I think that's really important. Yeah, it really is important. Um, the, the idea of network effects means that uh, the the your network of people that are in your industry or in your, your sector um, have got, there's momentum there. There's, uh, there's other products and solutions that they've adopted and and if you're going to introduce a new product into that into that industry into that uh, into that group, um, you're going you could wind up with some serious uh, barriers there just because uh, you've got this momentum of of the current situation. So let's say that you had a a, a new Excel spreadsheet uh, that you wanted to introduce, uh, and it had its own file format and all of that. Your chances of being successful are pretty bleak. Uh, because the number of users that are using Excel is all of them, <laughs> you know, everybody. And so, uh, and we see this all the time where someone is going to introduce a product that requires a whole bunch of people to come over at once. Uh, they, uh, and there's just a lot of resistance to it. Um, uh, speaking of Excel, I interacted with a founder a couple of years ago, one of the, um, you know, the, uh, you know, grant uh, organizations they had pitched to, and I was a judge, and I spent some time talking with them. And the problem they were they were having is is that um, they had introduced a product to compete with Excel in a specific niche, and they it was a reporting tool that they had identified that there was a need for it, and for these users in the HR community, um, if they had adopted this, they could feed data into it and would do all of these really cool things and spit out the reports and it would save them a ton of time and money uh, by doing this. And they were getting no traction. And in spending time talking to their users, nobody wanted to get away from Excel. And it was a nightmare for them. And they said, but this is so much easier. Yeah, yeah, but I can I can do all that. I can. And by the way, if I if I do your thing, I can't share that with you know, somebody in another company or whatever. It was just uh, it was just a nightmare for them. So that network of users that they had uh, that were using their current solution, which was Excel, and the and the the stuff that they had developed around it, all the reportings and the pivot tables and all that stuff, they just couldn't get past that. And you have to be able to dig into that uh, at the beginning on discovery. But they had developed a product and they weren't getting any traction. So again, there's nothing wrong with having that idea, but Somewhere along the line, before they built the product, they should have uncovered that 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 you know tra or that uh, friction uh, with the users, and probably not gone forward with developing the product and saved themselves a ton of time, and money, and effort. No, that makes total sense. I appreciate that description. Um, well, let's summarize, right? Let's go over like uh, the conclusion here of again. Let's reinforce this: top five product teams that are successful, they actually care about the you know, go, no, go decision. They take time and effort in their R and D phase to get as much data, talk to customers, iterate, and the list goes on. But let, let's just highlight some of those major factors here uh, for the audience and then we'll wrap it up. Um, absolutely. So, uh, you know, the first, the first measure is desirability. We talk about that all the time. You know, is it, is your solution desirable? Have you developed something that people are actually going to want to use as opposed to just solving a problem, but you know, are they willing to adopt it? Um, the other thing is, is it feasible? Can you pull it off? And I think that's also another uh, huge, huge decision point. You have to say, do I have the resources to do it? Do I have the team? Do I have the finances? Uh, you know, the funding that I, that I need in order to do this. Uh, we see far too many startups that, uh, you know, say, well, I'm going to need three times the amount of money I've got, but it'll be great. I'll get, I'll get something built, get a prototype built, and money will come. And you can almost see the uh, the crash coming on there. And the last one is uh, viability. Uh, is it going to be viable in the market? Do you have a business model that's going to support it? Uh, are you going to be able to continue to to grow the product? And is it going to have a a, a great uh, business model that uh, that has traction and and allows you to scale? 
Yeah, if we had a pyramid uh, based on all that stuff, I think the foundation that we talked about was, do you have a plan that's not based on intuition? Uh, have you designed a specific plan around needs and value? And you just cannot do that if you're not designing products that are user-centric, which is putting your customer or end user right there in front of you, holding yourself accountable, doesn't matter how much you know, doesn't matter how much you think you're a subject matter expert, are they willing to validate everything that you're doing? And that takes falling in love with the problem, not falling in love with the solution, right? So uh, listen, I've had a great time. We didn't think this was a sexy topic, but that's fine. It's a critical one. So that's why we're sharing it. Uh, hopefully we gave you something to think about. So appreciate your time, Ken. Until the next one. Thank you, Cesar.